Hello, everyone, and welcome to Esri Press Interviews. My name is Stacey Krieg. I'm an acquisitions editor at Esri Press, and today we are talking to Don J. Wright and Christian Harder. They're the co-editors of the two books, Esri GIS Science, Volumes 1 and 2. So thank you so much for coming, and I'm happy to have you here. It's great to be Thanks, here. Thanks, Stacey. <laughs> so a little bit about our two interviewees. Christian Harder is a technology writer and information designer at Esri. He's the co-author or author of several books, including the ArcGIS book, the ArcGIS imagery book, and GIS for Science, volumes one and two. And Don J. Wright is a geographer and oceanographer and the chief scientist at Esri. She's a leading authority in the application of GIS to environmental science and the author and editor of numerous scientific books, including GIS for Science, Volumes 1 and 2. So we had some really great uh, questions and conversations through GeoNet for you guys. So if you don't mind, we'll just get started. So how did the idea for the GIS Science book come about or come to fruition? So I can start off with with the first part of it and then pass off to uh, to Christian. So the the idea for GIS for science was hatched in Jack Dangerman's office on exactly I'm looking at my notes here, April 11th, 2017. Ooh, so uh, <laughs> it was a meeting that Jack had with with me and with David DiBiase when he was at Esri. David was our prior education uh, team lead. And Jack was talking with us about how we could better serve uh, universities and research institutions around the world. And he really wanted to, he was brainstorming with us at that time about uh, ways that we could increase the uptake of GIS at universities, which at first is counterintuitive because GIS is used a lot in teaching, but not as much in research. And so we have been trying for, for several years to uh, help researchers to see how GIS can actually be an optimizer or a for, force multiplier for their science across all of the sciences. And so at that on that day, Jack said, you know, let's do a book. Dawn, I want you to uh, edit a book. Uh, we didn't have the title at that time. It wasn't until I was able to connect with with Clint Brown and most importantly with Christian on mm -hmm. what would now become what has become GIS for science. And one of the things that I really enjoyed about uh, being connected with Christian is that I had been uh, reading or using Christian's Esri Press books for years while I was a faculty member at Oregon State. And this is my first opportunity to work with him on an actual Esri Press book. <laughs> and when uh, we discussed the idea, he came up with this fantastic notion of this being a different type of book, a more visual book, uh, and a, a cross between Wired and National Geographic and so forth. So Christian, I'll let you pick up the story from, from that point. Great. Okay. Well, you know, I was really intrigued when I heard the idea for this book. Um, of course, you know, those of us have been around Esri for a long time. Uh, we hear Jack's mantra in our head all the time about how the real purpose of Esri is to support our users and these scientists are, you know, very much our users of our software, but I didn't really know that much about what was going on in that space. So I was really intrigued to be able to drill into this topic. And uh, so now we're on a second, working on the second volume right now, about to release it. Uh, right. The first volume came out a year ago. So, and there are 12 chapters per volume. So we've actually had the opportunity to work with 24 different scientists, or actually more than that, because some of them uh, have teams have multiple people on them. So it was just um, really a deep dive into all these different topic areas. So like in the first volume, for example, um, we have people studying archaeology and glaciology and uh, uh, the ecological marine units and the ecological land units and all these things that I've kind of heard about and that were, you know, good applications of GIS, but I had never really been able to drill into them very deeply. So it was really kind of a privilege and an honor uh, to be able to go on a journey with these scientists and really learn about what they were doing with the technology. Another really intriguing part about this project to me was the idea that science has become 
politicized. And there's a lot of um, work of scientists that gets kind of treated like a football and kicked around on the field. And I think we lose track of what the actual scientific messages that people are trying to tell through their research. The beauty about GIS is that it's kind of a neutral platform. It's not kind of, it's very much a neutral platform. It's just a way of presenting data spatially organized. So it's a really, um, I think a way of kind of cutting through all the noise. You know, there's the signal to noise ratio is pretty low right now in the political and scientific, um, you know, landscape that we're dealing with right now. So this idea that um, this book could help to really focus the spotlight on the work of these uh, particular scientists and really increase the signal to noise ratio. Yeah, and if I could add to that, we did not time this book to come out during uh, all of these uh, crises and the pandemic and uh, the presidential election and all, all of that, but the timing of the book couldn't be better. And for the reasons that Christian has outlined, because one of the things that is also very important about this book is that Jack has commissioned that the book be sent out to all of the major scientific agencies and universities in the world. And given that this is a book that lays out use cases in terms of how all of these different types of scientists have used GIS to solve some of society's most vexing problems, including climate change, this is a very important time for this for this book to be out. And we and it has been a, a journey with all of these scientists, many of whom have been using our technology for a long time, but several who are new to GIS as well and have found uh, that GIS has indeed been an objective and effective and uh, a very communicative way to, to do their research and to answer their research questions. Let me add one more thing about this content. Sure. These stories are stories about the scientific research first and foremost, and the spatial or GIS components are often I don't want to call them secondary, but they're not the primary focus. But what's neat about these stories as you read them is that you see the thread of spatial thinking and GIS kind of weaving through all these stories. And that's the common denominator in all of this. And we may get into this later, but uh, one of the things that has been so exciting about GIS for Science Volumes 1 and 2 is that there's GISforscience.com, which is a very thorough digital supplement where everybody can dive into story maps, workflows, Python notebooks, journal articles, uh, dashboards. And so for the COVID-19 chapter that's in volume two, there are over 45 items uh, in uh, associated with that uh, section where uh, the readers can see the dashboards, uh, the several podcasts that SD Garrity, our chief medical officer has done uh, mm -hmm. podcast that Lauren Gardner of Johns Hopkins University has done, uh, all the, the tools, workflows, everything that Esri and our partners have produced pretty much for a science audience up to this point. You know, having worked on print books for many years at Esri, uh, one of our challenges has always been in how do you talk about GIS in print when it's such a dynamic digital medium? Yeah. And over the years, you know, we've done a lot with companion websites and things, but I think we're really coming into fruition on this kind of content. So the companion website at GISforscience.com is really leverages ArcGIS, ArcGIS Online. Um, for example, all of the content and the items that Don's referring to are actually live items in ArcGIS Online. So in a way, we're kind of leading people who may not be too familiar with ArcGIS Online and, and the ArcGIS Online ecosystem, kind of luring them in and getting them to click on items and open items. So everything from story maps to web scenes to web maps and other kinds of content that live on ArcGIS Online can be found on that site. Yeah, I know we have some really great resources on that site, so I would recommend that anyone um, who's interested in the book also look at the website or just look at the website because I know it's um, it's full of really good information. 
So we have um, a little bit more personal question from uh, one of our readers on GeoNet is how did you get into GIS? What drew you into GIS? So I think either both of you can answer. I'd be interested. Well, I'll, I'll start. Uh, I have a deep confession to make as Esri's chief scientist that I did not even know what the acronym GIS stood for until I became a doctoral student at UC Santa Barbara. Uh, but I'm old, you know, I was uh, a student in the early 1990s, which was a very critical time for GIS and for GIS for scientists. I think during that, the early part of that decade, a lot of scientists in ecology, uh, oceanography, uh, geology and geophysics started to catch up a little bit to the traditional conservation biology and hydrology communities that have been using GIS throughout the 80s. But I was given a data set that was collected with a deep sea vehicle, the same vehicle that was used to discover and photograph the wreck of the Titanic. They collected this data in ARC Info, sort of as a lark, uh, just to test out this GIS that they were that they had been given at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. And when they came back from sea, uh, they gave the data to me as a uh, graduate student to decode and to make maps from because I was a geography student at UCSB. And so I was forced at that time to learn about GIS, which I was going to the next quarter. I was supposed to take intro to GIS the next quarter, but I was given this data the summer before. So it was a fantastic introduction to GIS at that time. And uh, it was so exciting because of what the the maps were representing and from that's how it started for me. OK, so for me, I was working as a research manager at a newspaper at the Press Enterprise newspaper in Riverside, California. And back at this time, this was in the early 90s, uh, the Press Enterprise was actually a very fine little um, award winning family owned newspaper. And they invested a lot of resources in editing and reporting and trying to be on the kind of cutting edge of, of um, reporting digitally, so to speak. So at the time, uh, about 1992, the 90 census data had just been released. And um, I was given the job of kind of making sense of this data and preparing some articles and graphics to support um, and just to basically tell the story about how um, the census data affected uh, the, the residents of Riverside County. So I remember very clearly the day the box showed up, you know, from the Census Bureau, and it was like about filled with about 10 binders, and each binder had about 100 CD-ROM disks in it. And so I started popping those into the computer and looking at them and realized it was all tabular data. I mean, just, you know, hundreds and thousands of of tables of data and after about you know 30 minutes of looking at all these tables it kind of dawned on me it's like wow this stuff seems to be geographically referenced you know it was it was re referring to zip codes and block groups and things like that i thought there must be a way to actually put this data onto a map so i started doing some research and i discovered a program called atlas gis uh, which was um, one of the leading desktop GIS softwares at the time. It was MapInfo and, and Atlas GIS were the two. Anyway, the newspaper bought Atlas GIS and I immediately started learning it and getting into it and just kind of went down the rabbit hole with that technology. I just loved it. It was such a kind of right brain, left brain combination of things. You know, you were working graphically with data but it was still statistics and numbers, and it was just fascinating. So over the course of about six months, uh, we ended up using that software to produce literally dozens of articles for the newspaper about the 1990 uh, census. And um, frankly, I'd never looked back. I mean, I kind of, to the, to the expense of other responsibilities that I had at the paper, I became really an Atlas GIS power user at that point. Now, interesting little, kind of footnote to history here is that um, some maybe, I don't know, eight or 10 years later, Esri actually purchased uh, the company that made Atlas GIS mm -hmm. called Strategic Mapping. And uh, we took over the product and uh, eventually converted all their users to ArcView users. But um, at the time, it was a quite a 
interesting and powerful uh, desktop program. So that's how I did it. Great, thank you. So we have a question specifically for Dawn. Um, how did growing up in Hawaii affect your career passion? Well, growing up in Hawaii had everything to do with, with my career passion. Uh, I spent most of my childhood uh, swimming and bodyboarding, uh, mm -hmm. running along the beach, climbing trees, uh, dreaming about being Jacques Cousteau because I had been watching that on TV. When I was eight, I decided that I was going to be uh, an ocean, a deep sea photographer because I saw what Jacques Cousteau was doing. Uh -huh. He, I think, is more of a... A deep sea photographer than a scientist. But when I learned more about what he was photographing, and as I learned more about the science uh, that he was trying to illuminate through the stories that he was telling, I learned that there was this field called oceanography. And then I learned about uh, other people like Sylvia Earle, uh, who were doing uh, deep sea science. They were actually studying some aspect of the ocean. Most people think about marine biology, so they think about all of the animals, but growing up on, on a volcanic island with a dormant volcano, I became very interested in geology and in rocks and ultimately in the seafloor. So uh, Hawaii was a perfect uh, incubator for that, and I have a, a lot of friends who are at the University of Hawaii who are doing uh, this, this type of science including with, with GIS. Wow, it sounds amazing. <laughs> and Christian, you were at the inception of Esri Press. So can you share something a little bit about the early days of Esri Press? I'd be very interested to know. So uh, yeah, so this is a little bit of ancient history. <laughs> um, so I was actually hired into Esri as part of the sales team. Uh, believe it or not. I was working at the Press Enterprise newspaper and I found out that this company in Redlands was doing something similar with GIS to what Atlas GIS was all about. So I sent an unsolicited resume to Esri and got a call a few days later and, and uh, was actually hired uh, into the sales organization. I think it was because I had uh, somewhere on my resume it said I had sold newspaper advertising at one point. So uh, I got that job and I was happy to um, kind of jump out of newspapers, which at that point, even then the writing was on the wall that um, that was kind of a diminishing industry in terms of revenue, advertising and so forth. But um, just so happened that Esri was in Redlands, not far from Riverside. And uh, so I came over to Esri and um, worked in the sales organization for a couple of years and actually answered the 1-800 number from the first day that it was plugged in. And, um, <laughs> My job was to basically pick up the phone and answer questions. And if I didn't know the answer to a question, I would have to, you know, take their number and go out and talk to somebody in the company and get the answer. And I did that for two years and, and handled literally, you know, thousands of calls. And we grew a small team around that. And it was uh, really fun and gratifying. And I learned a lot about GIS and the technology and what our customers were doing with it, most importantly. But I kind of had a hankering to get back into writing and um, and publishing. So I wrote up a, a book proposal for a book about applications of, of GIS in the business sector. And uh, I called it ArcView Means Business. And I was actually shopping it around some outside publishers uh, at the time. Next thing I know, I had a response from one of these publishers that they were actually interested in it. So I thought, uh oh. I better actually let Jack know what's going on here. So I sent a uh, proposal up to Jack's office and uh, within a couple of days I was in his office and uh, his only comment to me was, you know, he was all stern and looking at the proposal and I thought I was in big trouble. And he looks up and he says, well, why didn't you send this to me first? You know, because he was really interested in, um, in kind of pushing these ideas of GIS into different market sectors. So. Long story short, um, I ended up working on that book for about six months, and turns out one of my colleagues, I found out, a guy named Andy Mitchell, was also working on a book called Zeroing In at the time, and we were we were both working on our books. They were both case study books, and we were working independently. We didn't <laughs> know 
where we're each working on that. But when they both got finished uh, in the summer of 97, uh, Esri pu published both those books at the user conference in 97. And those two books became the first books that carried the Esri Press imprint. Wow. Wow, very interesting. I remember those books <laughs> as a attendee of the user conference. Well, <laughs> we did not know very much about book publishing at the time. And I think we ended up uh, publishing like 25,000 copies of each, which is just an insane, <laughs> run, right? But it actually worked to our benefit because we had so many books that when we were selling a fair number of books into the book trade, but we were also uh, able to use books in the sales and marketing uh, situations. So they became these little things that people would take out on sales calls and leave behind. And um, that was kind of a big you know, light bulb going off for Esri in general. Even before 97, Esri was very much involved in book publishing. So we had uh, put out a book called Understanding GIS that Clint Brown was the lead author on and worked on with Mike Livingston and Andy Mitchell and some other people. Uh, Nick Frunzi, who's our current director of education, did a book uh, called The AML Workbook, which was our first kind of big brick, you know, guidebook to the technology and how to use it. Sure. Uh, and right about the time I got there, the Bill Miller's team did a book called uh, Getting to Know ArcView. So yeah. Esri had already been dabbling in publishing, and these books were actually quite successful, even though, you know, we didn't have any formal uh, distribution. They were just kind of sold through word of mouth. We did big press runs. We had plenty in the warehouse to sell and to give away. And in particular, with the um, all three of those big books, they became really favorites in the in the college and university markets uh, because there really wasn't anything else out there. So through course adoptions, you know, we sold a lot of books, but more importantly, we gained a lot of mind share. You know, people nice. learned Esri technology in their college classrooms. And the idea was hopefully that once they graduated from school and they went out and got jobs out in the workforce, um, they would, um, you know, recommend, you know, ArcInfo or ArcView software as uh, the tool to use in their jobs. And I think it's kind of worked over the years. Oh yeah, I can attest to, so Christian's been at Esri much longer than I have. I didn't join Esri until 2011, but during this time period that he's talking about, I was teaching GIS at Oregon State and those books were my, the lab manuals for my GIS courses. They were invaluable. Well, I know our mission at Esri Press is, you know, to be of use to our users first and foremost. So it's really interesting to hear all those names that have been there for a while. And what do you feel is the single most important technology used to discover the ocean today? And what kinds of technology are needed in the future? I'd like to say that GIS is the most important technology, but uh, GIS is fantastic for dealing with the data and you must have uh, the vehicles that are on top of the ocean and in the ocean in order to gather that type of data. GIS cannot do that for you at the outset. So the types of technologies that we are hearing about now, such as uh, the bathymetry or the water depth, the right. photography and the uh, side scan sonar or the backscatter, these types of uh, vehicles, and they're all types of vehicles now, and many of them are on drones. Uh, many of them are on submersibles, and having we're, we're giving this interview now with uh, a group having just come back from the deepest spot on our entire planet, yes. uh, Challenger Deep. And yes. we, uh, we're doing a story map actually with Kathy Sullivan, who is now the most vertical woman in the universe. She was the first American woman to walk in space, and now she's the first woman of any nationality to reach Challenger Deep. Amazing. The submersible that they used collected the data that we will be incorporating into our Esri Ocean base map, and they uh, will be using Esri technology to map out that data. So I would say that the sensors, is the sensor technology is the most important for discovering the ocean and understanding it. Wow, that's great. Yeah, I read about Kathy Sullivan and 
she's that's just amazing <laughs> that she's gone so far high and way down below so that's really cool and i hate to make a joke but she is so down to earth <laughs> yeah she is yeah. Just a really she's, nice nice person <laughs> yes. she's also featured in women in gis volume one if anybody wants to read yes. her yes uh, we have to update it though because now she's done this great thing with challenger deep so yeah we'll continue to the story she also wrote the forward to volume one yes. of GIS. Thanks. Oh, well, great. Okay, so yes, that's amazing. So yeah, oh, she's uh, it's really cool. Yes. So this next question is for both of you. Um, what do you see um, in the future of GIS in science and GIS as a whole? That's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I'll, I'll chime in quickly and have um, uh, Christian, I'm eager to hear what Christian thinks about this from the standpoint of a designer and a writer uh, as well. But from the from the yeah. standpoint of um, of science, it, it's making me think about our theme for for uh, for this current virtual you see yes. where uh, GIS is everywhere. It's ubiquitous. It's in the cloud. Uh, it's uh, connected to all of these different sensors, the Internet of Things. Uh, and so I think that's where the future for, for science is going, where it, even if you're out in space, if you're in the ocean, if you're looking at the uh, mutations of COVID-19, because that's something that's happening right now, we know that the virus has mutated. So uh, the genetic code, that's something that can be mapped in a way with GIS. So I, I think uh, this idea of it being everywhere, available everywhere, is going to be a continuing trend for the future. Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, like Don said, I've been doing this for a while now. Actually, about 25 years I've been in GIS. And when I first started out, you know, you spent the majority of your time creating data and making a database. And it was only at the very end of the process that you got to do anything kind of analytical with it. Nowadays, the GIS is basically ready to go. You know, you log into ArcGIS online, grab some data from the Living Atlas, and you're within, you know, moments after logging in, you are looking at interesting data and visualizing things and panning and zooming and exploring. So that's a huge breakthrough. Um, it's become so much easier to do GIS that as a result, you know, we have millions and millions of, of GIS users on the planet now. And um, I really love what our team has done on the development side with uh, both ArcGIS Pro as a desktop, very powerful desktop package. And also on the online team, uh, we have made some huge strides in just the ease of use and how quickly and, and easily you can get up and running uh, with GIS. So um, a lot of the things I've worked on over the years have been targeted at this kind of new user audience, you know, the ArcGIS book and understanding GIS. And um, we're actually going to be doing another book um, starting, you know, right after this conference and getting started on it. And it's, again, it's targeted at that same audience to kind of, like evangelize the how great and easy to do, easy it is to use this technology now. It's really fantastic. The other thing is in the area of uh, kind of 3D and visualization of our world. Um, yes. I think you know people, especially young people now who are grown up with computers, they just feel kind of naturally at home in that kind of 3D environment and. Uh, ArcGIS is right there with 3D content, and we have, you know, indoor GIS coming online now. So it's just a really exciting time for uh, data scientists and people who are into uh, data visualization and statisticians and just kind of a, uh, a wide open field for all these um, professions to kind of get engaged with GIS and hopefully through you know, books like GIS for Science, um, that'll happen more and more. And our last question is, if you wanted readers to take away one thing from reading this book, GIS for Science, what would that be? <laughs> and 
That's a hard one too, because it's got so much great information in it. Well, I think the the, the one thing I would uh, ask readers to, to take away is that uh, this book will help you, it will enrich your view of science mm -hmm. because we have so many different types, different disciplines right. that are represented in the stories. So science is not just sitting in a lab with test tubes and beakers uh, doing chemistry. Uh, science is out in the field. Uh, it's it, it covers all of these different disciplines that you see uh, highlighted in the book, and it also includes social science. One of the most compelling chapters in volume one was the chapter on homelessness in Los Angeles. And so there there is uh, this is science for social good to serve people's needs as well. Yeah, and I would just say it's really interesting, I think, for readers to be able to go in to these specific stories. Like, for example, we have a story about uh, the organization Global Forest Watch, and their mission is basically to monitor the extent of forest loss across the planet. And one of the things I learned in working on this is that we're basically at about the halfway point right now. You know, we've used up half of the original forests in the world and our half are left. So, you know, maybe it's the time to start thinking about really conserving what's out there. Um, there's also just from a technology standpoint, a lot of really interesting stories in here. For example, there's a group um, in Virginia at uh, Virginia Commonwealth University doing research on invasive catfish species in Chesapeake Bay, and they use drones and artificial intelligence and machine learning to basically come up with pretty darn accurate counts of how many of these catfish are in different parts of the uh, water system up there. And that helps then plan kind of remediation efforts and um, just another just neat technology story. And one more I'll just kind of throw out there, uh, another kind of old friend of Esri is a guy named uh, Roger Sayre and all his colleagues at the USGS. So they have been engaged with Esri for many years doing ecological land unit research and also the ecological marine units. As part of doing the, the marine unit work, they had to actually account for islands. And so they actually did uh, quite an extensive update of the world database of islands. And like, for example, I didn't know it, but there are over 330,000 islands over one kilometer square uh, on the planet. And this, so this chapter with them is just a kind of a deep dive into how they went about measuring and, and counting all these islands and actually not just measuring and counting, but actually digitizing them all, the ones that didn't already exist. Um, so it's just all these different Stories will definitely you'll definitely find something to pique your interest in this volume. Let's put it that way. Well, thank you. We're really excited to publish uh, volume two coming very soon. But I'd like to thank our editors of volume one, GIS for Science for volume one, Don J. Wright and Christian Harder for taking your time today to talk to us. So please take a look at GIS for Science Volume 1 and GIS for Science Volume 2 coming soon at the Esri Merchandise Store and on any online retailer that you'd like to visit. Thank you, Don and Christian, and have a safe and happy rest of your week. And we'll see everyone at the virtual EC.